Spider-Man, the friendly neighborhood superhero loved by many around the world. He's amazing, or spectacular in this case. Peter Parker has been through a lot over the years and issue 310 of Spectacular Spider-Man is a key result both character-wise and in a meta context of who Spider-Man is. And to make things clear, this isn't a video on exploring how a Spider-Man story should be told or how the character should be or anything dysfunctional or characteristically pretentious like that. This video in particular takes a look at how the heart of Spider-Man is explored throughout this one beautiful issue. Now, those with the most basic familiarity with Spider-Man, especially in regards to the comics, will notice that this issue is a part of the spectacular Spider-Man line, not the main amazing one. It's, it's still 616 to be clear, but it's the sister line, which at one point in time was being written and published right alongside Amazing in the main spotlight. A lot of major events have happened in Spectacular, like the death of Gene the Wolf arc, a lot of tombstone stories, and certainly not least, the death of Harry Osborn. This issue was written, penciled, and inked by Chip Zartsky, who also at this point in time is writing incredible stuff on Daredevil and Batman, and as for Spider-Man, has written Spider's Shadow, a what-if story based on Peter's initial time with the symbiote, and Spider-Man Life Story, which I'd argue is one of the greatest Spider-Man stories of all time. And each issue takes place in a different decade from the 60s to the 2010s. Also, we can't forget the work by this issue's letterer, BCU's Travis Lanham, cover artists Mike McCone and Dean White, and assistant editor Kathleen Wisniewski. And while controversial for a lot of recent problems in comic Spider-Man, editor Nick Lowe, editor-in-chief C.B. Zabluski, and to a lesser extent nowadays, Chief Creative Officer Joe Caseta. President Dan Buckley and executive producer Alan Fine are also listed for their involvement, not to mention Spider-Man's creators, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. The story of this issue involves various interviews taken about Spider-Man and their view on the hero. The perspectives, as you can guess, are very mixed. There are those who are indifferent, really only calling him weird or too old for his spiffy costume. There's also those who tell Spider-Man's relationship with cars, the lifting of them in both cases. One to a shop for fixing, and the other to fix the face of a vampire. The owner of that car was less than happy. The page ends with a woman calling Spider-Man amazing. But we'll get back to her particular story later. One of the most appealing parts about this story and Spider-Man as a character is the down-to-earth nature. Each person we see interviewed is very grounded and really helps flesh out the world and society Spider-Man and we as readers find ourselves in. A man considers Spider-Man a freak, but a relatable freak as he too is something of a freak himself on weekends. And then the father and his daughter pop up for one interview. The daughter's so excited to tell her story even if it was actually about Daredevil. An older woman details Spider-Man's helpful nature in a case with her groceries. Unfortunately, her ice cream melted due to the webbing's two-hour time limit. And then we get to an owner of a local hot dog stand who's conflicted on Spider-Man, to say the least. The hero saved his life, and he then promised Spider-Man free hot dog from now till death. So now Spider-Man shows up for a hot dog almost every single day, including giving his expansive thoughts on ketchup and its major importance in the hot dog meta. Other thoughts on Spider-Man are ones of indifference and dislike for his masked spying on citizens. But one woman details Spider-Man's selflessness, that anyone would use their powers to get rich or anything they wanted instead of just helping people. When asked how she knew that he doesn't make money, she states that she sees him almost every day eating free hot dogs. The two main perspectives here really give this look into Peter's overall character, his down-to-earth nature, and his close relationship with the New York community. Peter's oddity and social position also make him incredibly relatable. The last of the main interviews explore Spider-Man's overall heroics. 
One police officer explains his distaste of Spider-Man, a joke in his eyes as he does all the work dealing with the hero's actions. But coming to Spider-Man's defense is Captain America, who says that he's one of the greatest men I've ever known. That means a lot coming from Steve Rogers. But the next and last of this section, contrast, just goes with a simple approach. Spider-Man is bad. So yeah, perspectives are mixed on the good old webhead. The interview with the mother and her story detailing her experience with Spider-Man is a large and key part of this issue. Spider-Man was out on a last patrol for the day, contemplating why crime happens so much at night. When finally crime appears for him to deal with, and a chance to talk to actual people, and not just himself. The webslinger quickly takes out the robbers for the police to further deal with, and then traps the last criminal before realizing they're a child. A child clearly in anguish at his actions and position, pressured by the other robbers into being their lookout. And Spidey does what he does best. He chooses a path of empathy, choosing to keep the kid from going to jail, bringing him back home to his mother, thinking that the initial scare would be enough. The mother later states that her son Kyle changed for the better after meeting Spider-Man. He was kinder, more motivated for school, a lot of which can be attributed to Spider-Man teaching and spending time with him. Spider-Man's care and kindness can truly change those around him. However, like in many cases throughout Spider-Man's career, his effort was rewarded harshly. The mother struggles to continue. The robbers who Kyle had worked with got on, on bail and thought the cops appearing was his doing. They murdered her child. Spider-Man later appears and tries to find Kyle at his home for their academic session. He almost gives up before ringing the doorbell and right when he's about to leave, the mother opens the door and cries in Spider-Man's arms. We cut to the murderers on the run slowly becoming more terrified while facing the scariest enemy you could ever encounter. A silent, angry Spider-Man. In contrast to catching the robbers earlier this time, there's no talking, nor humor. Afterwards, he takes off his mask on top of the roof and cries in despair and guilt. The interview with Kyle's mother shows just how human Spider-Man is. In her words, I've seen Spider-Man. I know Spider-Man. He's just, just a guy who wants to help. Spider-Man saves people, but like anyone else, he struggles and sometimes he fails, and the pain never really goes away. After the end of the interviews, we finally get to meet Colin, the creator of the documentary, who has been interviewing people on Spider-Man. As he walks home from working on his project at university, he runs into the friendly neighborhood individual himself, who asks about a why a documentary on him of all the superheroes in New York is being made. A good question, as Colin recalls his initial meeting with Spider-Man. It turns out that date night and mechanical octopus fights are activities that don't seem to mix. In the conflict, Colin took massive damage to his wardrobe from garbage. The young Spider-Man seeing what happened makes an empathetic and maybe a bit flawed judgment call to give the guy his normal clothes. Another story of Spider-Man just trying to help. Spider-Man feels great now that he knows this isn't going to be some Netflix hit piece on him, but Colin now asks a question in return. How did the famed webhead find out about this small indie documentary? The last interview in the issue just so happens to be with Peter Parker, Spider-Man himself. Peter talks about his potential conflict of interest given his public relationship with the wall crawler, but in the last three panels he gives a very intimate look into his actions as a superhero. Peter doesn't romanticize Spider-Man. He doesn't talk himself up or talk himself down, he speaks objectively and empathetically. Peter paints the picture of a human who makes mistakes, who can't save everyone, who hopes that people see that he's at least doing his best. Peter talks about the weight of all of that, how heavy it must be to keep going through fear, 
failure, strife, and public distaste, but knowing, hoping that he's helping people. And more than anything, how Spider-Man will never stop trying. And that marks the end of the issue, alongside a full letter from Chip Zdarsky talking about his time writing Spectacular Spider-Man and a small message from editor Kathleen Wisniewski. This issue really reaches the core Spider-Man unlike any other Spider-Man related media. The interview format and the grounded street level context and aesthetic really help with that exploration of Spider-Man's character. Utilizing human characters, a physical and very understandable entity with many perspectives, works well to build and touch upon the socially constructed idea of Spider-Man, both within the narrative and even from a meta context. The mix of tones from really upbeat and goofy to painfully depressing also help flesh out the story and Peter's character, a multifaceted individual with many years behind him. And that's really all I have to add. If you liked the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to get this issue, it's pretty easy to find online, be it digital or physical. And as for Chip Zdorsky, he has a YouTube channel and a website and a blog. That you can read and support on Substack. Uh, but with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you so much for watching.